Hello everybody and uh, very welcome to the Nordic Pavilion on uh, COP26 in Glasgow. We continue the day with yet another event where we once again are connected live with our back door to COP26, uh, our hub in Helsinki. My name is Mats Lindqvist and I represent the, uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers. And uh, we here in Glasgow are really looking forward to the next uh, event and hope you are you too have the same feelings in uh, Helsinki I hope you're there can you hear me we are and we are here Matt and good evening to you and good evening Glasgow my name is Andre Yamalt and I'm a colleague of Mats and uh, we are all set to this joint event between our Nordic hubs uh, in uh, Helsinki and uh, the pavilion in Glasgow um, we have an interesting topic uh, with the title Towards and Beyond Carbon Neutrality, what role for voluntary carbon markets? And uh, before we start, I would like to emphasize that our many events during COP26 is all about dialogue. So in that sense, we encourage our audience both here in Helsinki and in Glasgow to join in with remarks and questions to our panelists. And speaking of which, um, my panel here in Helsinki is uh, Mati Kara with um, the Nordea, Nordea Bank and um, Kari Hemakoski, uh, which is from uh, the Nordic Environmental Environment Finance Corporation, NEFCO. And with those words, I would like to give the word back to Glasgow and um, Maria Karlberg. Thank you so much, Andre. I hope you can hear me well. Yes? You can. So, welcome all to this event from Glasgow. Before I give the, the floor to the moderator, I would just say some brief words about the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nordic countries adopted vision for 2030 to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. And this touches on these topics here today because we're talking about carbon neutrality. And in 2019, the Prime Ministers of Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, Norway and Iceland adopted a carbon neutrality declaration to work together to become carbon neutral, carbon neutral in, in the Nordic region, but also to pursue international cooperation in this regard. And this is why we're here today. And, and carbon pricing is actually one of the elements in this declaration, which we're here too, from Hannah Marie. So with further ado, I give over to Hannah Marie and to the rest of the panel. And I think we will start off with a video. And uh, yes. The floor is yours, thank you. The world is not yet on track to reduce emissions at the pace needed to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So even though there is many things that need to slow down for the sake of our planet, the effort to stop climate change needs to go faster. We have developed a climate strategy to ensure we are part of the solution, not the problem. Of course, the production of our outdoor gear is where our biggest impact lies. That's why I'm particularly proud of the fact that our climate commitment covers not only the emissions from our own operations, but also includes the emissions generated from our full supply chain. From the extraction of raw materials, all the way up until the delivery to our end consumers. This makes our targets very challenging, and we would need to look at every area of our business and beyond to get there including increasing the use of lower impact materials, transitioning to renewable energy in production, ensuring that our products last longer and exploring new business models. 
All of this while also engaging our end consumers and supporting stronger regulations to accelerate change. But it's going to take time to have an effect. That's why we have decided to speed up the process by taking responsibility for our emissions along the way and becoming climate neutral already in 2021. Now, climate neutral is a nice term, but it doesn't mean we don't have any carbon emissions. It means that we are compensating our own emissions by supporting projects that would hopefully avoid or reduce emissions faster than us. We think that feels a bit like cheating, but in this case we think it's justified to speed things up. The urgency of the climate crisis means we need to pull every lever we have available to us, and for now that includes offsetting. The important part is to ensure this doesn't get in the way of the real work of reducing our own emissions. To ensure we do this in the best way possible, we focus on purchasing only the highest quality carbon credits available on the market. Verify to reduce emissions, while also providing extra benefits like jobs in local communities or protecting biodiversity. The projects we are currently supporting include renewable energy, reforestation and forest protection. We will also work to transition any offsets which rely only on reducing emissions to ones which remove carbon from the atmosphere. At Hoglas, we always think that the journey can be just as interesting as the destination. So we will keep you updated on our progress, talking honestly about climate neutrality and our road to net zero. We hope that you will join us along the way. Okay, so there was a bit of a icebreaker from Sweden, a uh, Swedish outdoor company, Hagløvs, and we thought we'd show this because it really captures the discussion we have in the Nordic countries at the moment on, on the use of voluntary carbon markets. Is it good? Is it bad? So um, as a brief introduction, um, my name is Hanna Mariahan and I come from Perspectives Climate Research. Uh, and I'm working on the Nordic Dialogue on Voluntary Compensation, which is funded by the, the um, Nordic Council of Ministers. And as part of the Nordic Carbon Neutrality Declaration that Marie mentioned, there's also an, uh, a commitment by the Nordic countries to encourage Nordic companies, investors, local governments, organizations and consumers as well to work towards carbon neutrality and to, uh, also beyond. So this is where we are focusing on the voluntary compensation side. So it's not just the government's working, but also a lot of non-state actors. Um, and we've been asking Nordic stakeholders what they think about all of this. And 97% find that the company's carbon neutrality targets and claims are very welcome. And they're a sign that companies are taking climate change seriously. However, 86% feel that they're confusing and hard to understand and hard to compare. And even over 80% feel that they could be, could be misleading and could create misconceptions that something is zero emission when actually it is not. So this is kind of where we got started with the Nordic Dialogue on Voluntary Compensation. We launched it just before midsummer last, uh, this summer. And we have this goal of informing Nordic but also international stakeholders on how to use voluntary compensation as part of the broader efforts towards and also beyond carbon neutrality. And in particular, what we're doing is we're aiming to promote high integrity, transparency, um, and harmonization of voluntary compensation, and align it with the Paris Agreement's long-term goals of one and a half degrees um, maximum warming, and also the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the way we do this is bringing together Nordic, public and private um, stakeholders, first of all, to understand the issues and the definitions and the concepts together. Because if we don't have a common language, then it's very hard to talk substance. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of what we see is, is really to bring everybody on board on what do we mean when we talk about carbon neutrality? What do we mean when we talk about net zero? How do they, are they different or the same? And then what is the role of voluntary compensation and all of this? Uh, in a way that's high integrity and transparent and harmonized. 
And then we would co-create recommendations for a best practice approach for Nordic, um, Nordic use of uh, voluntary compensation. And we don't do this as a, in a bubble. We will draw on and also complement national initiatives that are going on, but also international initiatives. And that's where we are having our international initiative representatives here with us. And the way we're going to do this is, um, for the common understanding, we have a report that we just published two weeks ago, and it kind of tries to map all the international guidance and initiative right now, but I have to say, things are changing and developing so fast that it's just a snapshot, but it, it tries to help everyone get to the same page in the Nordics so that we can get started on the dialogue. And then we have the survey, we have target consultations, blog posts and events to get everybody on board. And then in terms of the recommendations, um, by April 2022, uh, we would have a draft code of best practice for Nordic compensation and then also an action plan. And the action plan is a bit of a to-do list and all the ideas that we come across during this dialogue, but we cannot do ourselves right now. So it's a bit of a task um, list for future cooperation. Um, and with that, I will thank you. And uh, we will then like to hear from you as well um, on who you are here and also to my understanding, everybody watching live and also in the Helsinki side um, can participate in this poll. So there's two questions uh, and you would need to go to www.menti.com on your mobile phone and enter this code. I hope you can all see it. I will read it out loud in a moment. And it's 19410409 is the code. And then you get these questions and then we can see what you think about these things. So the first question is, is it clear what carbon neutrality and net zero mean at the sub-global level, at the level of governments or companies or consumers? And just please raise your hand in the Glasgow audience in case you can't see the code, it, it is quite small. Wonderful, someone's managed already. <laughs> and we'll give you a, a bit of time to get there. Slow. <laughs> Is it? Are you in here? It's, it's just been very slow. I hear it's been slow, I'm sorry about that but we already have eight votes, so hopefully we'll get some more. Mm -hmm. And I hope everybody in the Glasgow audience has already voted. And so what we can already see from this result is that it's not a clear yes, no answer. It's yes, no, or somewhat. So um, this is something we've also heard from the Nordic um, stakeholders that it is really not very clear. Um, but there is someone who, is, who finds it clear as well. So that's also a positive, positive sign. And I think now it's can time. Can ask who? No, we don't <laughs> ask who. <laughs> you can come to me afterwards and tell me how clear it is. Um, and then we would take the next question, and maybe you can help me with that. Thank you. Oh, here we go. It's there. So the next question is, can voluntary carbon markets be used for ambition raising in the context of carbon neutrality or net zero goals? Yes, somewhat no, or then it's okay not to know as well. and you have voted and it's not showing, mm. but when it shows, I know it's you. <laughs> okay, it seems we have some technical problems here since we're seeing shaking heads. Well then, I guess we won't know what you think, so we will answer the question anyway with our distinguished panel <laughs> here. So moving on, um, I would like to start with some questions for our panel here in Glasgow. And then we will move on to Helsinki, just so you know that we haven't forgotten you over there. Um, and we're going to start with Helen Manford. 
and she's here because she's uh, working for the CPLC or the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, Steering Committee Co-Chair and Vice President, and also for the World Resources Institute. And at the World Resources Institute, she uh, co-leads work on Build Back Better for the COVID-19 crisis, uh, looking at climate policy, green growth, biodiversity, water, fossil fuel subsidies, and green fiscal reform, and also works for the um, task force on net zero goals and carbon pricing. So, Helen, uh, we would pose similar questions that, that we just proposed to the um, audience now. So what should or what does carbon neutrality and net zero mean at the sub-global level? Thank you so much, uh, Hannah Marie, and it's wonderful to be here and be having this discussion. It's really a critical one, I would say, these days as we're here in Glasgow and as we're seeing both inside the discussions um, in the negotiations, the announcements last week, a lot of ambition starting to come forward. Not yet enough, we know, but there's quite a bit, but also outside the halls here where we've got uh, the youth movement and activists who are asking, what does this all mean? Is it robust? Is it real or is this greenwashing? So this is exactly the right conversation to be having. And what we've seen recently is from the IPCC, from the scientific community, a very clear statement that we need to cut emissions in half by 2030 and we need to go to net zero by 2050 if we are to keep alive this global goal of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we've got countries stepping up, but it is a, it's an all of economy um, uh, ambition. We all need to contribute. So the role of corporates, the role of the finance sector, the role of subnationals is also critical. We've actually seen an incredible momentum around net zero these last two years, I would say. Um, for those of us who were in Paris uh, six years ago, it's not something I think any of us really foresaw, that we would move from you know, um, almost nothing uh, aligned with net zero to 2019, where we had something like net zero pledges covering about 16% of the global economy. So that's just two years ago, we had about 16% of the global economy with net zero, and now we've We've got well over 70%, potentially 80% covered by net zero uh, pledges. So this has been really exciting and important momentum aligned with what we need to see actually happen according to the science. But there's also questions about this and it's really particularly criti critical for corporate net zero targets and those in the finance sector to really see that we are doing this in a consistent way, a rigorous way, as you said, with integrity, with transparency and a harmonized approach so everybody can understand what's being committed and how it's being delivered and then hold corporates and others to account just as we do with governments. Right now, what we've seen is a lot of the corporate commitments have been done in very inconsistent ways, using the terms carbon neutrality or net zero in different ways to mean different things. Um, and that has led to confusion and distrust. So that's one of the things we're trying to tackle. Now, um, in the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, what we've done is come forward uh, just a couple of months ago with a new report where we looked at net zero and what this means for national, subnational, and others, and what we need to do to deliver it well, and what role there can be for carbon pricing in that transition. So we've looked at some of the rules and the approaches that can actually do this in a way which is rigorous. And in terms of corporate responsibility, the Science-Based Targets Initiative just released a week and a half ago, very recently, a new net zero standard that really provides the first science-based framework for companies who want to set their net zero targets in line with the climate science. And we've got over 2,000 major companies around the world now who are saying they want to set science-based targets to hold themselves to account and move forward. So this net zero standard really provides a common, robust and science-based understanding of what net zero means, both in the near term for what is needed in five to 10 years, but also for long-term decarbonization and for all scopes of emissions across your value chain in a given company. 
it clarifies that science-based net zero requires companies to achieve deep decarbonization of around 90 to 95 percent of emissions reduction by 2050, which aligns with the IEA's recent 1.5 C pathway. And then for the residual emissions, we need to neutralize those in a way where we're absorbing those in a permanent way um, from the economy. Um, so we need to have a very small amount of residual emissions in 2050 left over because we cannot cut uh, all, uh, all emissions by that stage. But whatever that very small percent is, around 95%, um, no more than 90% need to absorb that and counterbalance it with um, permanent removals. Now the purchase of corporate um, external carbon credits is encouraged in this system, but it has to be in a way which complements the value chain decarbonization that companies are doing. It, it cannot be a substitute for it. So one of the things that's really important is that the traditional ideas and sense, the way we've talked about offsets in the past, that's something which there's no more room for. We do not have room for it from a carbon budget perspective or a land use budget perspective. So what we're really looking at here is how we can complement what companies need to do themselves to rapidly decarbonize as far as possible to net zero, how they can complement that by additional investments in nature-based solutions and other solutions which can help to compensate for the remaining emissions. So even as they're going on this net zero trajectory, the, there is this opportunity and we're seeing corporates starting to step up and really um, uh, provide investments in other solutions, carbon credits, um, through nature-based solutions to complement what they're doing themselves. But it is a different perspective and I think one of the things we'd love to see is that we actually retire that term of offsets and that concept, because that is the old term, that is what we saw before, and we just don't have space for that anymore. This is a new standard for what we look to corporates to do to actually ramp up their ambition. So. I hope that helped to answer some of the question there, Hannah Marie, thank you. Thank you so much, and um, I think if there's any questions that rise, then Mark can be the one answering them. But Mark has been working um, as the co-executive director for external affairs at the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, which is a quite new initiative that focuses, and you, you can tell more about it, on, on what can you say when you've been doing things the way Helen described, or if you haven't been doing them the way Helen has described? <laughs> to my understanding, there's a bit of a link there. Um, and Mark's a very diverse background in over two decades of energy and climate issues in the government, the NGOs, and the private sector, and currently is a managing initiative aiming to make capital providers aware of the climate transition risks to investments. Um, so off to you. And I would like to ask you pretty much the same twin question from the VCM's perspective, VCMI's perspective on, first of all, you know, net zero and carbon neutrality, how do they differ? And then what are you doing to address the confusion that exists right now? Yeah, and first, thank you very much, Henry, for having me here today, and thank you for, for listening. I mean, the first part of the question, I'm just going to say ditto, because I agree with absolutely everything Helen very magisterially said, and so I don't think I need to repeat any of that. I just you know, emphasize the fact that we are in a new world. There was an old world where there was offsetting and it, you know, there were questions about the quality of some of the projects and some of the initiatives, but on the whole, people did, on the whole did it in good faith. And we've learned a lot from that. So let's not just sort of expunge history, we're not talking about revisionism here, but we're in a different place here. And I, I mean, on the, from the scientific and, and the you know, kind of climate policy perspective, I, as I say, I agree with everything that Helen said. I think one of the things that, um, where, we, where, where I think needs to complement the piece about being able to hold companies to account, be able to compare companies, being able to look at how companies' actions fit in with what nations and what the world should be doing, we mustn't forget that we live in a world where companies, especially those that face the public, want to be able to tell their customers, their investors, and their broader stakeholders what they're doing. And those of us who spend quite a lot of our time, hopefully not shopping, but being just public citizens and consumers, want to know what we're being sold. And I think you know, all of you will have had the experience that I have of going to the supermarket, and on this shelf it's fair trade, on that shelf it's organic, on this shelf it's climate hero, this yeah. shelf it's climate superhero, this is super, <laughs> what, the hell, what, do I, what do I do? 
And so the VCMI is trying to work with a number of initiatives, including ones that Helen's involved with and others, to create a very rigorous, but understandable and communicable set of claims that companies can make about their actions. And I'm not going to, I've given anecdotes on previous panels, so I'm not going to repeat them because you've heard them before about, you know, people I've come in touch with or look, at, you just had to look at the FT this weekend. Every other page was an advertise, advert from some company making some claim about itself. And then I had to get my glasses out to read the small print at the bottom, which explained what their claim meant. And you had to be, if not a climate scientist, a someone who knows pretty much what's going on to understand what on earth it meant. Mm -hmm. So one company said, we are net zero because we've invested in a renewables company. But no calculation basis for that. And, but if I wasn't in the climate space, I would look at that and think, oh, that's good. I've been told that renewables are good. This company's invested in renewables. I'm going to buy it soap or whatever it was. Um, so the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative was set up by a combination of philanthropists and others to provide some rigor, some consistency, and some understanding behind those claims. And we're working with a number of governments because the end goal for this from our perspective is that this gets regulated. Mm -hmm. That advertise, you know, in this country we have the Advertising Standards Authority. And if you make a false claim, or you make a racist or a sexist advert or something, then people can complain. Yeah. And you only have to look at our Advertising Standards Authority's website and the equivalents of others around the world to show that the public care about these things. They do complain, and in some cases they lead to litigation. And we've seen, heard examples around this COP of companies who've been litigated against because they've made false claims. And so we want to encourage that, but we also want to provide those companies who really are, as in the case of the video we saw, going above and beyond. And I have to say I was distracted by the beautiful landscape having been inside this for, for two, nearly two weeks now, but who are going above and beyond, who are doing everything they possibly can to reduce the emissions across the whole of their value chain, but want to do that extra bit, contribute to countries meeting their nationally determined contributions, contribute to saving biodiversity and our natural inheritance, and want to be able to talk about it. And it's perfectly reasonable. Like someone asked me yesterday, shouldn't they just do this out of the goodness of their hearts? Well, maybe, but we live in a capitalist society where companies want to advertise their wares, they want to pro pro promote what they're doing, and if that thing that they're doing is above and beyond, is really robust, is accelerating at climate action, is supporting more ambitious policy, both where they are and where they're investing, then I think we want to shout from the rooftops about it. But at the same time, we want to stop all the cheats, all the greenwashers, all the manipulators of public opinion, the bad advertisers from making the false claims. And that's what we're trying to do. And we encourage, well, we're willing to work with anyone who is prepared to work for us, who ha shares that vision. So often I'm asked, I'm just going to finish here, rather like in your surveys, is carbon in the old, sense, old framing offsets or the use of voluntary carbon markets a good or a bad thing? And that's wonderful in the world of Twitter where you have 140 characters and everything's binary. <laughs> but in reality, there's a big if. It can be a great thing if it is additional to corporate decarbonization. It's additional to NDCs, it's additional to what they should, people should be doing anyway, and it invests in projects and programs and initiatives, whether they be in the nature sector or in other sectors, driven by the communities who own the rights to those sectors, yeah. driven by countries' needs to accelerate climate action, and it can then be very positive in driving capital that wouldn't have got to those places and to those projects. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't do that, then it's really not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So the answer is not binary yes or no, it's a big if in the middle. And I think what Helen has said is, is the answer to a lot of those ifs or what, what ifs. Thank you, Mark. And although I didn't take notes, trust me, I am taking notes for the Nordic Dialogue on Voluntary Compensation. <laughs> There's a great report on this I issue as well and, and lots of work coming up. Thank you ever so much, um, our Glasgow experts. And now I'd like to turn to Helsinki, uh, hoping that Helsinki hears us. Um, and asking some Nordic actors in the Helsinki end, what does this sound like? Is this something that, that's helping? Um, I'm starting with Matti Kahra from Nordia, where he's working as a climate um, senior climate specialist. Um, he also has a long history of carbon markets. And I'd like to hear, Matti, how this carbon neutrality net zero situation is being dealt with in your current work. 
and whether the kind of initiatives that have been happening and maybe also the Nordic initiative might be something helpful and how could it be helpful for what you're doing uh, over there? <coughs> yes, thank you and, and good evening from Helsinki. I'm happy to report that the weather is, uh, is as bad as in Glasgow, so very <laughs> cold and rainy <laughs> and windy, so uh, this is a true, true uh, simulator in that sense. So. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, Nordea is, is one of the, the biggest banks in, in Nordics and in Europe as well. And uh, we are working very actively with, with climate, both on the, the loans and the investment side. So we have recently uh, committed to net zero, so being a net zero bank by 2050 latest, and set an also uh, an, um, an intermediate target of, of reducing our portfolio emissions by 40 to 50% by 2030. So we are very much uh, trying to do work and align ourselves with the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree target. And that will, of course, have huge implications for, for everything we do as a bank. Uh, when it comes to uh, net zero uh, carbon neutrality, I think uh, a lot of great things have already been said, but I think from what I can say from a bank perspective and the financial sector perspective, I think this this question takes maybe three different dimensions. The first one is the fact that since we are saying that all of the loans and investments that Nordea deals with have to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050, that means that we need to know where all of the companies that we invest in and all of the customers that we are giving uh, loans and finance to, where they are in terms of their own transition plans. And we know that a lot of companies in the Nordics, in Europe and globally, and as was said, have set now net zero targets. And we are, of course, very interested in what are in those net zero targets. We saw this very good and I think like a leading example from Hoglovs here on, on how you actually do credible, transparent, robust uh, net zero targets and how you use uh, offsetting or, or compensation along that journey. But we have a a huge amount of work that we need to do in order to understand our customers and the companies that we invest in and, and what they are doing, uh, how much they are reducing their emissions, what role will offsets and, and removals play in, in that journey. So that's, that's the dimension number two, uh, sorry, number one. Then uh, number two is of course uh, the, the fact that uh, since the voluntary carbon markets are a big opportunity to, to direct private finance to mitigation and adaptation, of course, we as a bank are in the business of financing something that is that, that makes uh, is, is economically good, but in this case also that we want to make sure and understand that we are, we are providing a net benefit to the atmosphere. So we are reducing emissions, uh, removing uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And on that front, I think, there is so much happening also. Uh, if you just take a look at, for example, some of the Nordic comp companies which are working either in the, at the project and uh, doing these actual projects where you remove carbon from the atmosphere, or you're looking at startups which are uh, starting to create products and services which are linked to, to compensating or, or neutralizing emissions. And then also that you have, we, have, we are seeing a, a fast growth in in standardization and creating marketplaces so where actually buyers and sellers can meet. Uh, one just example, uh, and I think is, is one of the, the, the world's first carbon removal marketplace is Pura Earth, which is a Nordic actor and which has been used, uh, it, the companies that it uh, is dealing with, is, it has been used, for example, in the, the Microsoft portfolio where they are looking at uh, uh, net, net zero and, and carbon removals. And then the third dimension, if, of course, I think in terms of, of the magnitude is a lot smaller, but we also have our own, for, for Nordea's own carbon footprint, we have set a, a net zero uh, or a net positive target by 2030 and looking at offsets. And also the fact that we are, in terms of procurement, we are quite quite big players. So annually we procure around 2 billion euros worth of of goods and services and we have now companies which are selling carbon neutral logistics or carbon neutral uh, um, catering services and so on so this takes many forms and i think uh, a lot of what has what was said by helen and mark around need the, need the need for 
to understand, to have transparency, to have comparability, to have integrity in the marketplace and really for financial sector and, and banks and, and, and other players to, to be in this market, we of course need to understand the true value of, 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 of the units that are created and also the fact that we have comparable transparent information that we, we can utilize. Uh, but we are very much committed to working with this and, and all of these initiatives and projects and the Nordic project, for example, have, are very helpful in, for us in, in helping us to understand the, the, the heterogeneous landscape that we are currently working with. Thank you. Thank you, Matti, very much for those insights. Um, and then moving on to Kari Hamekoski, since we have a tight schedule. Kari has 20 years of experience in international carbon markets, working for the Nordic Environment Finance Corporation, including on the um, Article 6 piloting side. So I'd like to ask Kari, since we are in the COP26 and we are going to negotiate the Article, we are negotiating the Article 6 rules and hopefully successfully concluding robust rules. How is this related to voluntary carbon markets and, and net zero? Thank you, Anna-Marie, your colleagues. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to discuss these crucial matters. So uh, I'm mainly interested in Article 6, and uh, I see it's it's kind of a tool that has a kind of, it's like a win-win-win tool uh, to, to really address climate issues. We have, um, I mean, it, it allows uh, ambition raising. It, it's possible to do real net mitigation. It's really cost-effective. I mean, there's a fairly recent study showing, I mean, utilizing Article 6 could save like a billions, 100 billions per year by, by 2030. So it's really kind of cost-effective way of reducing emissions. And yet at the same time, we can, we can support sustainable development in the, in the host countries. And especially from the Nordic perspective, like gender issues are really crucial. So, so it's possible to combine all this with the proper rules in place. So kind of win, 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 win uh, solution. Once or if we get the rules right. It also, it also kind of uh, offers buffer. You know, many countries are aiming for carbon neutrality. There may be some challenges. So uh, to meeting those targets, so this can offer cost-effective cost buffers for the governments and also for private sector. And then I definitely want to, want to highlight because uh, to really mitigate emissions, we, we definitely need the private sector. We, we, we need their involvement. And like the CDM, CDM provided uh, very clear incentive for the private company. And Article 6 can do the same. It can, can really provide like additional revenue stream for the companies. And, and we need the project, actually programs for Article 6. We need like a more policy with activity and that could really kind of uh, help to 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 challenge uh, uh channel climate climate carbon finance to to various activities so it's kind of win-win-win tool thank you thank you Gary. and um it does sound like then with the voluntary market and the article six market the same ifs um apply so i think there's a lot of um synergies that we can do with the Nordic Article 6 piloting and then on the Nordic Dialogue on Voluntary Compensation on the other side, so maybe we can do some cooperation. Um, and now we have a few minutes for any potential questions by the audience. Um, okay, good. We have a question there. And another one, great. Yeah, hi, my name is Niklas Kaskela. I'm Chief Impact Officer at Compensate. We're a Finnish non-profit uh, offset provider. Thank you so much for the uh, extremely valuable points. I think now with the science-based targets net zero standard, we have a good definition of net zero, but we're, we're, what we're lacking is a good definition of climate or carbon neutrality, which is the more commonly perhaps used term for like marketing purposes that Mark spoke about. How do we come up with a carbon neutrality uh, standard that takes into account the mitigation hierarchy so that beyond value chain offsetting would be also the last resort with those claims. And then a second question, if I may, how do we start introducing alternative claims like climate action claims or climate finance claims where you don't make an equivalency between emissions and the offsets, but we have two separate targets. For example, a company can have an emission reduction target 
and they can have a carbon removal target, but you don't create an equivalency between them. How do we start moving towards a system that would allow that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would suggest Mark takes this, at least, and if you want. Yes, th thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so the sort of big picture answer is, well, come and visit me at vcmintegrity.org um, <laughs> and you'll see the roadmap of work that we've laid out for getting to draft claims guidance by April and it tries to answer very much those questions, particularly around the first part around carbon neutrality. What does that mean? And we know that it means many different things in many different places at the moment and we need to have something that people can trust. Now the second part, I, I find it it's a question that I answer, find it difficult to answer because I can see two ways of looking at it. One is, and this goes to a bit to what Helen was saying, how do we have something that's rigorous and robust and we know that there are lots of problems with accounting methodologies and we want to have something that's comparable. I think the words that one of the colleagues in, in the studio said, compatible or comparable with high integrity and transparency. Yeah. But when, what I was trying to say before is that while those of us in this space spend a lot of our time thinking about, so what is a mitigation contribution and a finance contribution and a removal and a reduction and how do they compare? The general public who are being exhorted by politicians either because they want them to do the work or because they're passing the buck to the public instead of doing the work themselves, need something they can trust, need something they can understand and they can trust. And I think if I go to the supermarket and I'm comparing a, a, a cereal product that has a, made a financial contribution with one that's carbon neutral, I'm not going to do it. So I think we need to find something simple that is robust and rigorous, which has some options behind it. And then for those of us who are checking, who are testing, who are holding people to account, then we need to have some better definitions. And I think that for me, of the three things that were mentioned, transparency is absolutely key to this. And in the many contexts, including the VCM Integrity Initiative, but in other places too, I've been arguing that because voluntary carbon markets are a public purpose market, they only exist to do one thing, drive action on climate change, then the public should have access to information about every aspect of every transaction, of every use, of every project, and then the public can know whether they trust, trust it or not. And that will be the other side of the, the simple claim type. Thank you. Did you have a question as well? Anna Marie, I think we also have a question here from uh, Helsinki. Oh. Okay. If you allow us. <clears throat> Let's allow you first, yes, then. Um, please state your name and uh, your question. Yes, so my name is Max von Eer Econ, and uh, right now the world is uh, working towards a climate-neutral world, I'd say. And uh, the problem right now, I'd say, with the negative emissions is that the, um, there is a bit of a skew towards uh, industrial solutions rather than the natural-based solutions because it's very hard to measure the actual absorption of carbon dioxide in uh, forests and in agriculture and different other natural-based solutions. So how do we debunk this problem with the... Um, well, it's easier to measure the industrial techniques rather than the natural ones, even though the natural ones might be even better and available today. Okay, thank you. Um, Helen, would you like to take that question? Uh, yes, let me say a few words on that. Um, in fact, I mean, we absolutely, we know we absolutely need to invest so much more in nature-based solutions. At the moment, we are continuing to lose forests around the world. We are not restoring degraded lands, whether um, agricultural or forest lands, fast enough. So this is somewhere where we do see a real opportunity as companies are starting to invest more in solutions beyond what they need to do um, in their own value chain, this is a real moment where we can get that boost in nature um, and in nature-based solutions. And that was a lot of the discussions and the exciting announcements last year, last week. Sorry, it feels like last year. <laughs> it's been a long, long cop. Um, <laughs> last week, we're actually really about how to get that moving. So there is an exciting moment here. I do think we've made huge progress in terms of actually uh, being able to monitor, evaluate, and measure what's happening in those land use, um, land use uh, 
uh, applications where we're doing that and do so in a robust way. And so I would actually point you to some of the initiatives that have come forward. The LEAF initiative is one, which is where we're getting companies and countries coming together and really setting out the standards for how to do these kinds of investments in a robust way where we can really deliver the solutions we need for climate and for nature um, at, at, at the regional level in a robust way which can be trusted. And I think importantly, it has both the environmental integrity and something we haven't really spoken about yet. It's also got the social integrity elements. How do you ensure as we're making these investments, we're doing so in a way which actually protects and uplifts uh, local communities, indigenous communities, and does so in a way where we deliver really on, on the results we need. So there are examples where we're seeing this in practice and we're seeing the standards, the high integrity standards and the socially beneficial standards come forward. And so I just sort of point you to look at those um, as, as some of the solutions which really do deserve the investments we have. Thank you ever so much. And I know we're out of time, so I can just assure you that these are questions that can't be covered in 45 minutes. That's why we have the Nordic Dialogue on Voluntary Compensation and the other dialogues globally as well. So we've only started this discussion and it was a bit of a taster of everything that's going on, but let's continue this process. And thank you ever so much. And please join me to thank our wonderful panelists here. And I hope you can hear us all the way in Helsinki.